Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Higher Learning. I'm your host, Oz Rashid. Today, we have a very special guest, Steve Noodleberg. Steve, I got to start with this. What's good? Oh, it's all good, man. It's uh, what's going good all, for you, man? Hanging with you is good. I was fortunate, you know, recently to get introduced to you. We decided to grab lunch in person, which I don't normally do. And, uh, you know, you're you, you've got a lot going for you. You got a lot on the ball. I use that term all the time and just super fun to hang with you. Uh, I learn something every time. I love what you're into. I love the fact that you're exploring and doing and growing your company. And you are the sum of the five people you hang out with. And you're one of my five today. So I'm psyched. Oh, I love to hear that. Listen, the feeling is completely mutual. I, I listen to the daily huddle. I love I, every time I'm looking for a little energy or a little motivation, I can go to your LinkedIn page and get a pop of it there. And I think I messed it up. I think you told me when we first met, you don't like to ask people how they're doing. You like to ask them what's going well or what's going good, right? Could you get better I, answers with that, so, right? You know, it's interesting. Early in my career, and I've been an entrepreneur for as long as I can remember, people would walk up to somebody and go, hey, how are you? And how are you is basically an invitation to hear what's wrong with them. Oh, my house, my car, my little, little, little. I, I didn't, you know, so you were starting behind the eight ball. So I just said, hey, why don't we change that behavior create an interrupt and say, tell me something good. Boom. We started doing that early in all of the seats in my company. You called the first person, boom. Hi, welcome to tell us something good. It changes the dialogue because we are not programmed to think good. We're programmed to focus on negative. You change that. And whatever the person says to you is something you can carry for the rest of your lives because it's important to them. That's how you start great relationships. So tell me something good is what is in my book. It's one of my calling cards. But those little changes in behavior, little changes in language is what my whole career has been about. Create success from the obvious. Yeah. And I totally butchered at the beginning, but I love that. I love the mindset aspect of it. Here's another thing that it does. It's so reflexive. How you doing? I'm doing great, right? Because you really don't want to get into the details and somebody's asking you because it's more of a pleasantry than they actually care. And so when you stop them and make them pause and, and ask them, you know, what's good? What's going on good for you right now? You get them to really rethink that and hopefully share something that's important to them and exciting to them, like you said. So I, I agree with you. It starts the tenor of the conversation in the right way. It already gives me energy. So I appreciate you kind of explaining that. And they remember it forever they go wow you made me feel good because no one ever asked like the the first time i really started training it i trained it with the folks at bank united pulled the random person up and i said darlene tell me something good she was like kind of stunned because no one ever asked you that she said to me my son just finished his second year at mit this lady was lit up like a christmas tree i said darlene that's unbelievable i go tell me more she told me more and more and more. She and then she finally pointed it to me and said, Steve, why don't you tell me something good? So it was the perfect setup for me to share what I was excited about, what I'm working on, which I know you do all the time. You ask people that perfect setup where we're sharing good information and people remember that because you don't have that many good conversations, unfortunately. Yeah, I love that. And listen, if you like, listen, you and I deal in relationships, I want to be somebody that people want to come to and want to talk to, I want people to want to share with me. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a secret sauce here from when I was in college, my wife's not going to love me sharing this story. But I used to go on a lot of dates in college, because I wanted to meet different girls. So I, you know, valedictorians or dropouts or whatever it is, everything in between, I was trying to figure out me, right. And so I would go on these dates. And my secret was, I would just ask them an open ended question. And then I would let them talk and just keep asking questions and be very interested. And they'd go home to their roommate and be like, how did the date go with Oz? Oh, it's amazing. We had such incredible conversation. And really all I did was I was being authentically curious to find out about them. Because at the end of the day, that happens so little. The interactions that we have a lot of times are very superficial. And if you can get, I really want to have deep conversations. I want to figure out what makes somebody tick. I want to make somebody feel uh, better, understand them. And that's a great way to do that. So you are preaching to the choir in that, bud. And I think that's why you and I get along so well, because we don't have these superficial conversations. We get to a little bit of a deeper level. And I appreciate you know, that. It's so interesting. And a lot of people I coach, they like, you know, I want to be interesting. I said, don't worry about being interesting. Be interested. 
Bingo. Be interested in the other person. Be legitimately, like for me, one of my rules for success was I'm insatiably curious. I just want to know what were the hurdles you overcame? Where are you from? What do you do? How do you, how do you get here? What, you know, all of that stuff, because every time it gave me an opportunity to learn and that got better and got better and just started digesting. So if you really do listen, the clues for success are everywhere. You've cracked the code, my man. Now, listen, I'm going to be a little insatiably curious myself here. Good. I want everyone who, anyone who follows you on LinkedIn and you got a lot of followers sees you traveling around the country. You're doing these speaking engagements. You're working with your sons. You got on the ball ventures. I'm interested. How did you get into this world? Because I imagine there's a lot of people who want to do it, but have no idea how to go about it. So I'm really interested in your origin story and how you ended up becoming who you are and kind of this entrepreneur for on the ball ventures. I'm happy to share it. So on the ball is the company's 35 years old. I have done something under that name started as a sports marketing company was working with coaches and athletes creating marketing opportunities um, for large organizations that just didn't know how to do it so i built a roster of contacts you know don shula uh, jimmy johnson you know i mean big names of people who i could then match up with my corporate base Anyway, so I've done that forever. It kind of morphed and became different things along the way. But, you know, the origin for me was I sold my company eight years ago. Somebody in my market in South Florida reached out to me and said, hey, love to have breakfast with you. And I was like, okay, cool. Went and had breakfast. He said, I think you're one of the best salespeople I've ever met. You're very well known. You're very well respected. You've had career success in a couple of different verticals. So it wasn't luck. He goes, I would love for you to work with my team. And I was like, I don't really do that. I go, well, what would you want me to do? And he was like, well, I'm putting together an event on the West Coast. I'll have a hundred bankers in the room and I want you to work with them. And I was like, what, what would you want me to talk about? I don't know anything about banking. And this was really interesting for me. He said, I want you to share how you became successful. Mm. said, I, I can do. So I started thinking and writing. I got up in front of these hundred people. And for anybody who's curious, I was scared shitless. And all of the things I've done in my life, getting in front of a hundred people was nerve wracking. Got up on stage, cranked out my presentation. That presentation became my first book, which is Confessions of a Serial Salesman. It's nothing more than 27 rules that I have followed my whole career waking up early, eating something green in the morning, drinking something green in the morning, you know, all about making my bed, all these little simple hacks that kept me going through what is clearly the most, you know, the job with the most rejection. So the idea, and you know, so I spoke there, somebody heard about it, somebody else asked me, and it's very interesting because fast forward eight years, we have a boutique coaching agency. We work with CEOs, leaders, entrepreneurs who all want to grow, not only grow their business, they want to grow individually. And everybody says, how do I become a speaker? And I make it very easy for them and for your audience. Speakers speak. What people tend to get hung up on is, what do I get paid? Forget about what you get paid in the beginning. Anybody that would listen to me, I was up there doing it. So I volunteered. I did it in jails. I did it in hospitals, in kids, in senior homes. I spoke. I just made my craft. And so after a while, people said, wow, I've heard about you. You're really good. And I started asking, do you have a budget? Yeah, we have a budget. It was, oh my God, all of a sudden I'm getting paid. Then I got paid more. Now I get paid a lot, you know? So the value you leave behind in speaking never changes. If you're good at it, you'll the money will show up. But I think people have no patience for anything. They want to start a business. They want to start a career. They want it to happen overnight. There's nobody that did it overnight. There's no straight line. There's a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, a lot of consistent behavior, and a lot of patience that leads to it. So I've built my career where speaking is a part of what I do, but I say no to a lot of it. If I don't really want to be in front of that audience or it's not a good place for me to travel, doesn't fit into my life, I'm fortunate, but that's the byproduct of years of you know, applying my trade. 
Yeah. So a couple, there's a lot of things I'm going to pull out of that. One of the first things I want to say though is, and I've been thinking a lot about this recently, you and I post a lot on LinkedIn. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about recently is this idea of how get rich quick or get thin quick or get these results quick has really hurt our society and our perception of things, right? And I don't want to be this, you know, get off my lawn old man saying, you know, good old fashioned hard work and sweat equity will get you everywhere you want to go. But it really distorts your mindset on this idea of like, I want this and I want to do the least amount possible to get it. It's just so backwards, in my opinion. Look what you did. You started doing something you loved. You weren't good at it at first. You just waited for somebody to listen to you. Then you start to get good at it. Then you start to get paid for it. Then you start to get paid well for it. And so many people want to reverse that. And it's just, it's just, it's what separates the people who actually end up doing it versus the people who want to do it. And so that's something I think a lot about. And I think it's been very destructive. And one thing I talk a lot about my kids with nothing worth having happens instantly for anybody. And so the, he, here's the reality. We live in a world of instant gratification. I want it now. I want to microwave it. I, you know, I want the food now. I can't wait it. You know, so, you know, when people ask me about what's the state of our workforce, what's the state of our world, you know, the idea that old school still works, you know, all the things i learned from my grandfather still work. There are new tools that allow me to do it more efficiently and at bigger scale, but there's no substitute for the work ever. And that's what the mindset is of people is I've been doing it for a month, I'm, but there's no success. Like, what? You know, so I, I relate that to people as, as early as when you learned how to ride your bike. You didn't hop on the bike and become an Olympic cyclist. People, it takes time and effort and diligence and all of those things that I think there's a shortage of because we live in a credit card world. I want that in the window. I can have it and I'll pay for it later. That ruined our psyche. That, yeah. ruined, that you know, you want something bad enough. And I will tell you, most of the entrepreneurs I know will tell me, you know, they had a hard time doing it before it actually ever happened, but it's going to happen. If you do the work, it happens. Yeah. And listen, let me reframe this for everybody from, because I don't think it's necessarily just about how things used to be done versus how they're done now. To me, it comes down to, and this is a more progressive mindset, finding the inefficiency. Okay. 30 years ago, Billy Bean found the inefficiency in baseball. It's on base percentage. It's slugging percentage. It's not home run in RBIs, right? Basketball teams have figured out that the three-point shot is worth more than the two-point shot. And so we should develop our team around that. Right now, the inefficiency is everybody wants instant gratification. So if you outwork them and you outlast them, that's how you're going to separate yourself from the pack. And there's just, there's just no question about that. So no I appreciate question. that. I got another thing for you. I want to ask you. Okay. Good. Cause I asked somebody this who does a lot of public speaking and I'm very interested because I just did a public, public speaking engagement. And I had to kind of think through for myself, I'm getting in front of a lot of people. I want to make sure I do well. What are some tips that you have when you're going out? Cause I got to imagine still at this point, you still get butterflies every once in a while. How do you manage that? How do you handle that? Do you have any tips for people that are getting ready to do public speaking or want to do more of it that have helped you? Without a doubt. So number one is practice, practice, Practice. Look in the mirror. Get a, a you know small group of people together and practice your trade. There's no substitute for practice. Number one. Number two is if you're look if you get on stage and you're looking for validation, your audience will know it. I'm the expert when I get up there, so I have to be fully confident that what I'm saying is the right thing for them to hear, whether they want to hear it or not. That's a big paradigm shift. The best speakers are the ones who get up there and tell people what they need to hear, you know, because it's the right thing to hear, not because they want, you know, uh, that, you know, that, it, you know, there is an ego involved in everything. Let's call it what it is. But your job is to deliver information that can change, create change. And not everybody's going to be bought in. Listen, I'm a big proponent of social media. You know, I get asked to speak about a lot of personal branding issues and stuff like that. I'm not looking for anybody to validate me, even the people that pay me. I know what it is and I know what works. It may not work for you. You may not want to do it. That's fine. I'm not trying to sell it to you. But good speakers deliver information that's actionable. Wow, I could go do that. Whereas I think previous speakers, and this is the big change in the world, is people have experience. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've been up on Friday night going, how the hell are we going to pay everybody? You know, like, we got to figure this thing out. 
I was through the ups and downs. I've lived it. So nobody, I didn't learn that in a book. There was a big time when speakers got trained to be speakers. I think the authentic, genuine, vulnerable people who get up on stage and say, I've done this before. I'm going to share with you my view and what, you know, like you did. You didn't, you didn't learn it from somebody else. You shared what you believe in and what you know. Those make for great speakers. And that's an understanding that people don't necessarily have. Oh, I need to be trained. Oh, I need to belong to this organization. You don't need to do anything. You need to be genuine and authentic and share your stories from a place of vulnerability. And people react really well to that. So I, I want to follow up on that. And I think you gave a lot of really good advice, but here's something that really stood out to me, right? You're not looking for validation. Know why you're in the room. And I bring this up because throughout my career, I've been blessed to sit in front of and have audience with CEOs, VPs, CTOs, who's who list of people, right? And I've sat with peers of mine or other people uh, uh, at my, my level who came in and they wanted to know their the, the their audience's business as well or better than them. And they wanted them to feel that. Or they wanted to come in and just build a relationship. And one of the things that I learned pretty early in my career is the reason I'm in this room, I can't tell you how to run a supply chain. I can't tell you how to run a Fortune 500 company. But you know what I can tell you? I can tell you about hiring. I can tell you what's going to help you get the best talent in your organization. I can tell you what the best practices are. I can tell you what's worked at your competitor and what's worked down the street. And that's why I'm in the room. And so that is authentic to me and who I am. And so this idea of being something I'm not or trying to pretend like I know everything as well as my audience has never been my tactic. My tactic is I'm coming in here with something very specific. There's a reason I'm in this room. This is my area of expertise. And as much as we can be interactive and I can learn from the audience and learn from them as well, that should be part of the conversation too. So that idea of not going in there for validation, you're right. They can smell it on you like a bad cologne. And that's when things can get tough. Have you, have you, you mentioned that you've spoken in front of kids and prisoners. Uh, what's the toughest audience you've ever had? Was it the kids or the prisoners? Or is there one that I didn't, I didn't bring up? No, actually, that's a great question. So I got asked to speak at a business technology event in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And I always get there early, always check out the room. I sort of have an idea of who's going to be there. I'm a prep guy. And when I got there, they told me that the rest of the audience was first traveling in that day. And at four o'clock that afternoon, I was doing the keynote. And I was like, guys, I thought that everybody was here already. I mean, they're traveling in. And the only thing between me and the bar, between them and the bar is me. You know, I was like, when you go to a conference, man, you want to talk to people, you want to do whatever. So I was already on edge. And then I walked in the room and the room had gigantic pillars throughout the room where people were blocked. So I couldn't oh, see everybody, man. It was like one of those. But in all candor, I've been in, involved in you know lots of speaking engagements where the audience just didn't react very much like a comedian or other another entertainer. And you have to learn to roll with the punches. There have been times I've come off of my conversation and I say, guys, you clearly are not engaged in what I'm saying. What do you want me to talk about? Throw me a topic. And like, I do this. I didn't just rehearse this. What do you want to talk about? And they would get like, well, could you talk about that? But, but, and I would go perfect. Boom. And go off on a tangent with them. And that's when they knew that it was real. So you got to be okay and pay attention to the clues and say, all right, if they're not reacting to what I've prepared, what do you want to hear that shows people that you're not a stiff board that you can react and pivot. All those cool words that people talked about during the pandemic are real. If you can pivot, you live long. Man. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, before we get into the hiring questions, I want to ask you, it's obvious that football plays a big part of your life. Your sons have been in coaching. You were doing and working with sports teams around marketing early on in your career. Um, we talked about Don Shula, Junior Seau in the past, and we just had a conversation about the Jets. When I'll ask you this a couple of ways. When did football first kind of impact your life? And do you see some sort of allegory or symbolism for life with football? What is it about you that has drawn you and your family to football and made it so impactful for you? So wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. So for me, it's a, I break it up a couple of different ways. I was a basketball player when I was in young in high school and um, played three on three. I never made it to college, but I was a big intramural guy, won a lot of leagues, 
um, loved the competition. For some reason, my boys gravitated towards football. My older son, not as good an athlete as my younger son. My younger son was spectacular. But um, what I realized was that in sports, you get camaraderie, loyalty, discipline, commitment, all of those things that where else are you learning that? Where, where are you learning camaraderie? That it's okay that we're doing this as a team. You know, where do you learn that you got to play your role, be loyal, do hard work? I mean, football practice was miserable. I, you know, my son played quarterback. He got the shit kicked out of him. But you know what? It's It, it was something he grew to love and... God, when he stopped playing and went on to coaching, he missed the locker room. He missed being around the guys because there is something special that sports teaches you. And I really embraced that early. And then as I followed their career, all of the coaches I got to work with all had a process. It may not have been a winning process, but they had a process. Every great athlete I have ever met or that you can talk about, Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, LeBron, name it in, Wayne Gretzky, they had a process of how they worked, how they played, what they ate, you know, very disciplined. And if the parallels to any professional life is you got to be that committed. You got to be all about, all in, man. You know, Michael Jordan was cut from his ninth grade basketball team. Most people don't know that. He had enough fortitude to say, I'm not gonna allow somebody else to dictate my future. I know I can be the best. I gotta put in the work and he did. And for me, he's, and you talk about knowing your audience and stuff. I said that he was the best in a conversation in Cleveland. That did not go over well. Right? Oh, so. Listen, you're talking <laughs> to an old school guy. I grew up on the, uh, on the Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls. Last dance, you're never going to tell me LeBron's better than him. I, I, You put a gun to my head, I'm taking one guy for one shot every time. All right, I got a couple follow-up questions. Is Good. there a coach that you met throughout your life that you feel like most aligns with your mindset or your process, or maybe one that just really stands out to you as exceptional? Oh, yeah, Pat Riley. Um, so I was fortunate to meet Pat Riley. Um, I was in a different business at the time. I didn't work with him, marketing him. I was in the cell phone business, which was a big part of my early career, early success, we built a monster company, but I we did the phones for the Miami Heat. When he became the head coach, I delivered the phone to him, got to meet him, greet him. I got to know him. His attention to detail was amazing. Um, his He talked to me like a human being. He wasn't, and he's 6'6". Six, six. He didn't look down on me, you know, mentally or whatever and say, I'm the head coach and you're this, you know, bone guy. We, we He put me right in a place where we just bonded um, his book, which is, it's an older book, still fantastic, called The Winner Within. We all have Reddit. The Winner Within. The man. Disease of More. Yeah, <laughs> love Pat. Listen, you're preaching the choir. Pat Riley, I'm so glad you said Pat Riley. My hair slicked back. My dog is named <laughs> Riley. Uh, I grew up in LA, Showtime Lakers. I am a big Pat Riley guy because I think this is important for entrepreneurs to understand this too. I don't look at myself as an accepted, uh, exceptional individual I look at myself as a team builder, which you look at Pat and what he did in LA and then he goes and he does the Knicks and he builds a completely different system and team up there. And then he comes down to the heat and does what he does here. I have so much respect for that ability to adapt, that ability to define a culture. Everybody talks about heat culture. Love, love, love that answer. Last question on basketball, Steve Noodleberg, intramurals. Who is your game most like in today's NBA? So I was a small guard who could shoot from the outside, but love to get inside and mix it up and rebound. So there were not a lot of players like me, but I could box a guy twice my size, if you know the technique. So I like to get in there and mix it up, use my ass, use my, my legs, because I had big legs. So I was a surprise to people. I hustled my ass off. Right. I could shoot from the outside. My favorite shot was deep in the corner. So it was, you know, that was a tough shot, but I was a scrappy player. 
I just I'm going to call you Kyle Lowry. I'm going to give you Kyle Lowry. Lowry, okay? Well, you know what? Kyle Lowry when he was thin, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man, I hope he doesn't thin. listen to this podcast. I will tell you me, and we got to get on the court at some point, and now we've completely gone off on a tangent. Jason Kidd, because I play a big guard game too, yes. but I can't shoot for my life. I can pass the hell out of the ball, though. So we got to get on the court at some point. All right, brother, okay. let's get into it from a hiring perspective, because I know you've been involved with a lot of hiring. You've done hiring for your company. Do you have an overall hiring philosophy that you adhere to? What are you looking for out of people that you bring into your organization? So right or wrong, I have my philosophy. You could probably teach me things. But for me, um, if I didn't want to have a beer with you, it wasn't worth the conversation. And that cool. doesn't make you good or bad. I just was building a culture of like-minded people. And part of that was... Yeah, I, I like you. I want to, you know, I, I, to me, the idea of hiring somebody, even if they were the most skilled, but didn't have the personality, just didn't gel. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I don't think that's bad advice at all. In fact, at MSH, one of the things that we ask is, could we ride in the car with this person for five hours? Is this somebody <laughs> that we could see ourselves without wanting to open the door and, and knock them out? Because who knows, I might end up in that situation at some point. So it's important to hire people that, you know, same, you know, and you don't have to have same taste in music, but just as long as they're an easy ride. So I'm with you. I think that's a really good one. Do you have a memorable interview maybe that you were involved in in terms of interviewing somebody or maybe you were being interviewed when I ask you about a memorable one that comes to mind? So I didn't do a lot of interviewing for jobs because I owned my own companies. But I think every conversation is an interview. And I'll share a story in my son's life. My son uh, would go to the coaches convention every year, sitting around one day, he's having a bunch of beers and um, McElwain was uh, was there. He got introduced to McElwain through Eddie Grand. And there was nothing other than guys sitting around shooting the shit, telling stories and whatever. Uh, fast forward, Mark was in Cincinnati. He got fired. They were the number six team in the country, but they got he got fired because that's college football's politics and whatever. He was without a job. He wound up calling McElwain and uh, McElwain said, um, you know what, Mark, you never know when you're being interviewed. He goes that night at the, uh, that we were at the coaches convention. I wanted to hire you then you're my boom. And he got hired at Florida. Wow. Sort of, yeah. yeah so. so people know McElvain came from Colorado state, became the head coach of Florida and Cincinnati. I mean, I, maybe he got let go, but that's a cradle of coaches up there. They've had a lot of really good football coaches. So coaches what a great place especially. for him. So he learned the lesson, but the lesson I want um, everybody to get is, People like it's almost like when the lights go on. Oh, I'm interviewing. You never know when you're being interviewed. Ooh, I like that. That's good advice. Um, do you have a favorite question that you like to ask in an interview? Something that really kind of gets deep into the soul of somebody? Um, so all the HR people will hate me for this, but oh I used to, my whole career, I built big companies and small companies. We still use it today. Um, and there's steps that people go through before they get to me. And when they get to me, I have one question for them. And that question is, what's your favorite ice cream? And I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, so if someone were to look at me and go, vanilla, thank you for playing. We'll, we'll get back to you. No shots. Now, if they say to me, I love Ben and Jerry's, bop, beep, 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 bop, you know, uh, you know, they get into it, right? I think if you can't be passionate about ice cream or desserts, we're ultimately going to have a problem. You're just not going to fit. So then people would say to me, well, what happens if you can't eat ice cream? You can't eat ice cream. You're intolerant or whatever. Lactose intolerant. Those are the people who come up with the best answers. I can't eat ice cream, but I take Oreos and I mash them up and I add ice and I do milk and, I, you know, so for me, it never failed that if they told me what their favorite, like I could tell you in two seconds, I could dress it up, but it's like, boom, if you can't be passionate about that, I challenge your ability to pa be passionate about anything. Just work for me. Um, I've had hundreds of other people use it you know, afterwards and tell me great results. But with today's HR rules, I don't even know if you can answer if you can do that. Well, I don't think there's anything HR inappropriate about it. Here's what I would say. My answer is mint chocolate chip. And all of a sudden I feel very underwhelmed because I think I'm a very passionate no, guy. But no. I got to get, I gotta get more not. all in on mint chocolate chip. Oh, here's chip. why. My favorite is mint chocolate chip. What brand? Oh, good question. Uh, I'm going to go. Bryant. I like, yeah, I like Briars. I like Dan. I like Dan. Uh, yeah, chill, dude. Dude, 
Breyer's mint chocolate chip will be brothers forever. It's like, okay, well, we, we didn't plan this. Steve and I are going to go on the road together. We're working together now. Ice cream buddies for life. This will be a breakout video. I promise you, see, you that. That's how it's a commonality. It, whatever you say, it's something to talk about. And I just can, it's a really good gauge. Do it with your friends. Just see what happens. People generally get excited about, oh, I don't like ice cream, but I like custard. And I do, you know, they get passionate about it. It could be a whole conversation, but it gives you a look inside. Jackie, what's your favorite ice cream? There you go. I see. That's one. I, that was my other answer outside of mint chocolate chip. You're right. We started a conversation here. I love it. Um, when you miss on somebody, because we all do that you're hiring, yeah. right? When you missed on somebody, right? Maybe you went out and had a beer with them and you enjoyed it, but they didn't end up working out. What would you have missed? Where, where, where would you typically miss? So I have a tendency um, to try and hire people that are exactly like me. So if I went out with a beer for a beer with somebody and we laughed and we joked or whatever, I would be blinded to what they actually need to do. I get caught up in, this is going to be a riot, man. We're going to be in the same boat. It's going to be great. Boom, 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 boom. But when the boat starts to sink and you have two people doing the same thing, who's going to plug the hole, man? Oh, that was your job. That's a miss. That's a miss. And so I started to learn a couple of things. I asked for other people's perspective. I really did. And I didn't use me liking them as the only qualifier. And, and here's how I avoided mistakes because I made a, a bunch. Uh, they had to write me a plan. 30 day, 60 day, 90 day plan. I got to see how they write, got to see how they spell, and I got to see how they think. And that separated them from somebody I liked to somebody who can actually do the work. Yeah, it's such a conundrum because I think the number one um, reliable indicator of somebody that's going to be good in a job is if you can have them put something together in their own time and bring it to the table. But I know a lot of people worry about, well, you know, this is such a competitive market. Are people going to put in the time? Do they have the time? Do they have competing interests and family without knowing that they have the offer? But I'm with you. Anybody I've ever seen put something together as a proposal or as a program or as a plan, they've always been somebody that's been stellar. It's just that a lot of times it's really hard to integrate into the, into the candidate experience and the hiring experience. So I'm with you. I recommend everybody does it, but you also have to have the right timing, the right program, and you have to kind of set limits too. Because then you'll have some people that take like, 24 hours to do it. And you'll have some people that take a half hour on it. And that can be a good indicator, but it also can be, you know, you can have a lot of bad blood if somebody spends a lot of time and then they don't end up getting the job too. Right. So these are the type of things that you want have to think about. Heard, have you ever heard of something called an upfront contract? I have, but give, give me some details. on it for our Here's the context is that if we're going to work together, you got to show a little leg, I'll show a little leg, you know, so I'll give you more about what's going on and I'll tell you about, you know, but you should want to show me more of what you want to do. Like, what would you do without my company if you could? Like, if you're not willing to do that, and this is a big problem internally with people who want to get promoted, they go, well, when I become VP, that's what I'll do. I go, you keep thinking like that, and they'll hire a VP from outside because they're not going to mm -hmm. think of you for that job. Act like it's already your job right? Which is what somebody would do to prepare. You don't have to create something unbelievable. Give me a little leg. Show me a little bit of what you're about. And that goes a long way to separate you from the competition, I think. Fantastic advice, right? They say dress for the job you want, but you're right. Act like you're in the job you want. Start to, if you're not a leader already, start to show leadership qualities so they know that you're prepared for it. And along down the line, I think that's fantastic advice. All right, I want to jump into a little bit about a day in your life right now because you talked about having something green in the morning. Sounds like you got a pretty good regimen going on. You got your podcast in the morning with your sons. Tell me, what is a day in the life? And, and listen, I know it's different day to day, but give me kind of a standard day for Steve really, Noodleberg. It's really not so much. So virtual was something we knew was coming. We embraced it long before COVID. Um, we know we could be more efficient. I coach people all over the world without any fear of geographical or time boundaries. So my days are 12 hour days. They're 3.30 to 3.30. I take a 12 hour day divided by 15 minutes, right? Gives me 48 boxes to fill. I take the first eight boxes for me every day. I've got either all together or I've got two hours to me. And then the rest of the day is already pre-programmed with things I need to do. We call it a DMO, daily marching orders. 
I know what I'm doing. And at night before, um, when, bef before I go to bed, I actually print my calendar and print my daily notes. And you've heard of sleep on it. You know, big decisions, they tell you to sleep on it. I sleep on the next day. So I get up ready to play. Whoa, I like that. Now, listen, you, you and I have talked. Like, we, we both like to go out and have a, a libation every now and then. Do you ever not get your plan ready for the next day? Or is that already done yeah. before you even head out and, and, and go to a happy hour? I, I'm more like tomorrow night, I'll be in Miami. We have a client in uh, from out of town. We're having dinner in Miami. It'll be a late night. Everything will be pre-done so that before I hit the bed, I look at it, I prepare, I sleep about it. Uh, tomorrow, my post will be about visualization. I visualize what the day is. I've already visualized what this was going to be like, how much fun it was going to be, how you and I were going to really produce something special. I don't just show up and throw up. That's how people do. Oh, they're racing from meeting to meeting. I'm firmly entrenched in all of the outcomes because I've done the work ahead of time. I love that. That is fantastic. What are, now you listen, your passion just exudes off you. I love it. It's giving me energy right now. I didn't even need the Celsius, but I got to ask you, what are you working on right now that you're really juiced about? What are you really excited about? So a couple of years ago, my boys joined the business. They left the coaching practice. Um, I have given them all of the knowledge I could give them with the hope that they would grow outside of me and take the company to places I couldn't do. That, that's a difficult thing for leaders to do, by the way, and I coach a lot of leaders, is to let other people be the best they can be. That will take you higher places. With my sons, it's a whole nother set of parameters. So it's not just the president of the company, it's my son, but they will launch in uh, January an online training and development platform that is customizable for any company um, we already have three companies that will be in beta um, where they have multiple people within the organization that need to be trained and we can put in the software and then it's um, it's manageable, it's full on dashboard and visibility, it's content development, it's content uh, uh, retrieval, it's amazing. And here's where you really never know about relationships. The guy that we're working with, I met six years ago. He approached me saying, my platform would be perfect for your business. I liked my business the way it was. I didn't want, I'm done. I'm, I love what I do, but I don't need it to be bigger. Scaling is not always right. For my boys, they want to scale. And I could not be more proud that they did this. I've seen the early results, but I introduced my son to that guy who I knew six years ago. And I said, I think we're ready. And he goes, okay, let's go. And I go, it's not going to be with me. It's going to be with my son. And he was like, what are you talking about? I introduced him to Mark. And a week later, he goes, you should retire. <laughs> Just so. That's awesome. Now, listen, you're right. And, 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 and listen, family is obviously very important to you. Very important to me as well. Um, it is tough for leaders to kind of let go of the leash a little bit, let somebody else kind of put their own kind of creative spins on things. But it's different with kids, right? When people ask me, what's your objective in life? And I have a lot of professional things I want to accomplish, a lot of things that I personally want to accomplish. But my number one objective in life is I want my kids to surpass everything I do, both personally and professionally. And so there's two parts to that. One is I got to set the bar incredibly high, right? I've got to make sure that I do everything I can to set that bar really, really high. And then the second part of that equation is I've got to really empower and enable them to go above that bar, right? So whatever it is I think I've accomplished in terms of both professional and per personal, being a good person, being a good human being, I want to do everything in my power to give my kids the opportunities to far surpass that. And so it's got to feel really good to have something that you created, not just your, your kids, your sons, but also this business and be able to see them take part in it. That's just got to give you light every morning. Uh, there is nothing I've done in my life that even comes close. You know, and I've been fortunate. I've had a great career. I've met great people. I've been in the company of great people. There isn't anything that even comes close to watching them actually do it and do it at the level that they're doing it at. It's spectacular, you know, so it's it's both proud, it's legacy. It's something I never could have dreamed of because I let them, 
I supported them going in another direction and it boomeranged back. And so, you know, I think a lot of the business we get now, people love this father and son thing that we got going on, this interesting banter uh, for somebody 62 to be so involved in social media, so involved in my kids' lives. It's a really special time for me. I really love it. How how early did you get them involved? Because I got an 11-year-old and you got me feeling like I got to give her an internship here at MSH. So just how early did they get involved? Really early. So I, I let my kids know they were part of my life. I wasn't part of theirs. So I brought them to lots of things where people said, you can't really bring kids here. And I go, I just did. But they knew how to behave. I said, you need to learn how to behave in these adult situations and when people meet them now, they go, these are two of the most fantastic people I've ever met. I go, they were trained from when they were kids. They're like, when I see kids crying and all that, that just didn't happen in our world because we didn't accept it. You know, what you accept is what, you know, happens in your oh, life. Wow. You accept it, right, exactly. So, you know, they are disciplined, committed, loyal, great humans. Um, and they get to carry on the name which you're not going to meet a lot of Noodlebergs. So uh, hopefully, you know, when you do, it's a good time. It's a good time. Yeah, I got to say my 11-year-old and 9-year-old daughter would be fine. I think my 8-year-old would be in the back, like playing card games or selling used Rolexes or something. She's got, this one's a, a whole new whole new thing to deal with. So uh, I got to work on her a little bit. But I think that's great advice, putting them in situations that are teaching them how they have to operate in certain environments when they're way too young to even understand that. I think is really good parenting advice. We're getting business advice. We're getting parenting advice. We're getting mindset advice. You got to love it. How about, I'm gonna this? Ask a how about this? Because this is a real test of how you are as a leader and whatever. There were times when somebody would say to me, we need you to be in Kansas City at uh, on Saturday. And I said, can't do it. And they go, what do you mean? It's really important. I go, no, my kids play football on the weekend. That's really important. They go, I don't think you understand how important it is. And I go, yes, I do. And if that gets in the way, you can fire me now because you will fire me at some point. My kids won't. Mm, I like that. Make your priorities. You got to know your worth. And I'm sure it's worked out for you. And people incredibly. respected me more. They were like, you know what? I've never seen anybody stand up like that. Go do what you got to do. And I never missed the game. I love that. That is good. More good parenting advice. All right. We got to ask about a LinkedIn post. Okay? okay. On this morning's daily huddle, we had a fantastic conversation centered around how swearing may be a sign of verbal superiority. Here are some of the advantages of swearing. Cursing may be a sign of intelligence. Swearing may be a sign of honesty. Profanity improves pain tolerance. Cussing is a sign of creativity. Throwing expletives instead of punches. What do you fucking think? Now, listen, I've been known to throw around a cuss word every now and then, even on the old LinkedIn. Tell us, what did you mean by this post? So there is a report, it's scientific, that came out that said people who use what is considered a cuss word, right, have more connection to the people around them, more authenticity, uh, more emotion. It's an emotional thing. So the key takeaway is, while. Well, so I use the whole language. I don't choose different words that are good and bad because everybody has a different connotation. So I say to people up front, does language offend you? They go, what are you talking about? I go, there are certain words that people get offended by. Is that you? And they go, no, 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 no. Say whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> okay, great. I know now that doesn't mean I'm going to drop an F-bomb all the time, but I, you know, the event that you missed because you were speaking at Vanderbilt was our JA event. And it's a nice event. We have 300 people there. We raise a lot of money for the kids, whatever. One of our guests was Channing Crowder. Channing Crowder gets up. And I know Channing from when he played at Florida. I know him. Linebacker with the Dolphins. Yep. Right. A great human being. He has a 48-foot Viking that he put in the auction that he was auctioning off. So he gets up. They bring him up to auction it off. And he was going to do this fishing thing. And he starts dropping F-bombs. And the room loosened up. You got all these people and all these high levels and whatever. All of a sudden, Andrew Koenig gets up there, CEO of, of, of uh, City Furniture. Bang! He drops an F-bomb. Boom! Somebody else. It was a different night afterwards. Time and a place. Emotional connectivity. It does happen. 
then that doesn't mean you should walk around with a potty mouth. You got to know your audience. You got to know where you are. You don't want to do it on a plane when there's different people around. But time and a place, there's nothing like an F-bomb. And that's what our show talked about. Like, when you nail something, you're like, fuck yeah. You know, there's nothing like that, that guttural emotion. So we had a really good time. We got hundreds of thousands of comments um, it was wild. Second time we've done it. And there are some people, friends and clients of mine, who said they think it's a sign of infar- inferiority. You know, if you're a scholar and you're, you know, really tied to, you know, you thinking it's dirty word, then then this dirty thoughts, there's not dirty words. And so yeah. I don't have any malice. I'm not, you know, doing it. But we went through the different ways you can use the F word. And man, do we have engagement. It was so much fun. Yeah, there's a couple of things I'll say. That. So there, everyone knows the story, right? MSH makes success happen, but it always really meant make shit happen. Right. And so we've leaned into that more, right? So I think that's one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is, why do we decide to connotate words as bad or good? Like we can say the same word, right? Or the same meaning of a word and it's not bad. But if we use the F word, it's bad, right? Like, I don't get it. Who decided this? Like you said, time, place, audience, who are you cussing with typically? When I'm with my boys, I'm in the group chat or I'm with somebody closer and I'm talking to my wife, the right le- level of explicitive just shows connection. I'm comfortable with you. It's almost a sign of vulnerability, right? Yeah. Um, and so I know in the past, like the FCC and all these different things, and we had to have this kind of illusion of, you know, sacredness. And listen, I'm not going to go drop any F-bombs in front of like eight-year-old kids at an elementary school speech. But at the same time, you're right. The right impact, the right level. I don't think it's a sign of intellectual stupidity. I think it's a sign of, knowing your audience and knowing and being intuitive and knowing the right place in the right time. So I'll ask you if I ever use a cuss word on social media or in person, and I did it out of place, you got to call me out and give me feedback and I'll do the same for you. Okay. Yeah. I, I am very guarded about how I use the language. And like I said, I use it all. I'm happy to do that for you, but I would never post say or do anything without thinking of the impact it's going to make on people. Of course, of course. We're going to get a parental, parental advisory a warning on this podcast. So no worries, though. I'm here for it. Uh, bring it the fuck on. Uh, last thing. If you were able to amplify one nugget of career advice to professionals early on in their career that maybe you didn't have, what would it be? Um, uh, that's a great question. I have, there's a, a lot. But I would say um, totally focus on don't worry about selling anything worry about the people that you meet and get to interact with build your network just there, there's the the people that i've been able to call friends who will never buy from me are so many to count that we get trained early on in business you got to sell them and if you don't sell them you got to move on and that's complete complete horseshit it's so false the people you sell to are going to be the minority of the people you get to know and the people who get to know are the ones who get you through life mm, really good advice wise words from a wise man i asked you to tell me what's good you told me a lot man i appreciate you taking a little bit of time with me i wish you all the blessings and good luck uh and thanks for spending a few moments with us here on higher learning anytime brother now next time we got to do it over a cocktail we absolutely will talk to you later steve 